All right. Happy uh, <clears throat> happy Monday, Monday, Monday as I'm recording this. Hopefully you can see, hear me and see me okay. Hey, Suez. Yeah, you are here. <clears throat> you are here indeed on time. So the main purpose of the stream is I guess I'll just go over my PAX East 2024 experience. It was a bit of an abbreviated con for me since I didn't get to go on, I didn't get to attend on Thursday. And Friday was kind of partly a travel day. Like, so <clears throat> Friday ended up being a little bit of a dead, a dead day doesn't sound quite right. A, uh, a lost day, if you will. Um, so the PAX East is in, uh, is in Boston. I'm in New York City. I have family in Boston. So from that standpoint, this con is, a couple of ways this con is very easy for me. I have family in Boston. The, uh, the PAX folks are kind enough to uh, to give me a, they call it a content creator badge, but essentially like a press or media badge. So I don't have to pay to get in. So I don't have to pay to get to the, go, I don't have to pay to go to the con. And I don't have to pay room and board to go to the con. Those are the two reasons why primarily I go to PAX East. Not because it's not fun, but just because if I had to pay to stay in Boston and I had to pay to go there, then when you stack it up against something like Gary Con, I would pretty much go to Gary Con. And at one of these years, maybe next year, I feel like a lot of the a lot of the kind of first generations of folks are getting older, and we lost a couple this past year. You know, Jim Ward right before Gary Con. So I'm thinking that the clock is ticking if I want to get over there and potentially meet some folks from the kind of early days. But but for me, if I can't go to Gary Con, which I couldn't, Pax East is kind of a good good deal to go to now just the way things worked out i wasn't able to go on thursday so i missed kind of thursday day and then i took the i took the bus and it's actually the bus isn't bad it's not how i would prefer to go if i had my druthers but uh, the family needed the car so i couldn't take the car for the weekend so the choices then came down to the bus or the train and i really like the train Trains are great, but the trains, for whatever reason, I don't know what it is. I'm sure I could study up on it. I just don't know. You know, Amtrak, for those of you, I don't know if you're from outside the country, Amtrak, I guess, is the American. It's the basically cross. I don't know. It's probably, oh, it's it's the, the, the cross country kind of rail lines or Amtrak. You might have regional here in New York City. We have Metro North. You'll see New Jersey Transit over New Jersey. There are other things, but, you know, the, the more, I think most, a lot of the inter-country rails that what there is is Amtrak, and Amtrak's prices are not cheap. Not as cheap, I think, as every time I'm looking at them. And I know I talk to other people who feel similarly. Maybe there are people who ride the, use the trains all the time and don't seem prices to them, but pricey to them, or they they do it for work, and so they get you know some kind of benefit or rebate, or it's covered. Amtrak is expensive, and oddly enough, especially when you go from the faster train to the more Slower train, the time difference between taking the train and the bus, not very much. Uh, in fact, it was almost nothing. And I could basically both my bus rides were less than one train ticket. So the bus was kind of the, the no brainer. It's not as comfortable. I'm a taller person. I'm six three or six six. Yes, yeah, like six three, six three and a half, somewhere in there. Six three, I guess. Anyway, and I can't imagine how if you're taller. I feel like if you're taller than me. I hope you're an athlete or someone who has a very well-paying job because a lot of things are just kind of torturous if you have to do sort of regular people stuff. And for me, sitting in those seats, oftentimes it's slightly a little bit squished, a little bit uncomfortable. And then it's I had it twice on the 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 because uh, two times because the, the the bus had one stop in Hartford and some people got off, some people got on. Two times where the person in front of me jacked their seat back and like hammered onto my knees. Uh, and it's you know, I get angry, frustrated in the moment, but I can't really blame them because that's, they give you reclining seats, so recline them. But it's just to say there's no space. Um, and I, so, but even then, regardless of whether I take the train or the bus, I had to get up really early on Friday and I had to pack all my stuff into a backpack because I had to carry that stuff with me all day Friday. And so by the time I, so I, I leave, I get up at 4.30 something in the morning and then I'm out the door at around 5.00. Or 515, and that gets me to Midtown Manhattan, where the Port Authority is, uh, maybe 45 minutes before 7, all things included. And the Port Authority is a pit. Uh, I hope you never have to go to the Port Authority in New York City. It is 
horrible. And it's still horrible. I hadn't been there in years, and it is still horrible. Then you get on the bus. And so the bus left at 7, which was the first bus. But then I don't get to Boston until after 11. So by the time I get to Boston, then I have to walk. It's probably a good half a mile, which city-wise isn't bad. But I'm carrying what feels like, I don't know, just a ton of bricks on my back down to the con and moving around like I was already starting to kind of feel it and like oh man so I do a little circuit uh, there's a media room you can get into packs which is great if you have a media badge and they have lockers but if you don't get there early especially kind of Friday Saturday all the lockers are gone so no lockers so I'm carting around this big heavy bag um, and so I felt like I didn't get a lot done because I just was uncomfortable and getting tired and <laughs> my cousin who also goes to the con for board games was uh, he was just playing his board games. He, he likes to go into he goes into all kinds of board gaming tournaments. And I guess I'll say that one of the things like if you're a Gary con, right. Or if you're there with, if I guess if, and I haven't been, so I can't say for certain, but I imagine Gary con is like 90, 99% kind of old school gaming, which, you know, for me, it's like, Ooh, sign me up. Right. But if you're there with, you're going with friends or whatever, some, some people who may not be as interested in that. Um, Oh, my, my mic is super loud. Okay, I'm hot. I'm hot. Okay, well, it's not showing up hot here, but let me check on. Well, other folks, let me know if I am hot. This thing, I've got this thing that it's uh says auto adjustment on the mic. If I turn that off, I can turn it down. So let me know. I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to burn out anyone's speakers, but I don't want people not to hear me either. But thanks. Thanks, Drew. Um, so the one thing, so like, right, right. So Gary Khan, if you're in the old school kind of gaming and stuff, right, you're in heaven. But if you're not, you're like, I'm a gamer, but I'm maybe not so much old school gaming. I don't know how much there is in Gary Khan for you. One of the nice things of the PAX is, is you're going to find stuff. And if you go to the, the open tabletop playing room, they had all these versions of D&D from the white box on up that you could play. Get some people to just play randomly. But there's also lots of indie games. And they had, you know, 5th edition and Pathfinder. And not to mention at PAX East, you have the video game element. So one of the neat things is PAX and East and, you know, Unplugged is that there's, at any of the board games, there is just a lot, right? So my cousin, who is not at all really, I mean, he's some interest in playing. In fact, his, he has a board game group, and some of them are also, I think all of them but him are in a tabletop game. I think they're playing D&D 5th Edition. They actually tried to play one time and didn't have a great experience, not due to the rules, but due to just personalities. Uh, but he's, you know, he's pressed. He, and in fact, I think he actually played in a game. Yeah, he played in a game this past PAX also. Uh, but my point is, is that if you're coming with a family or with friends and you want to get a gang of people to go to a con, but you're not sure everybody is in a very specific niche like you would if you went to say Gary Con, it's something like PAX Unplugged or PAX East if they're in the video games. It's something where you can kind of find something for everybody, the kids or whoever who wants to go see, watch people play Tekken and play all these different video games they can go off and do that you want to play board games even though the board gaming area it's not the main part of PAX there's tons of board games and there's tournaments running all the time I mean my cousin filled up all he went all four days and played in like every game tournament he wanted to play in and of course there were more that he wasn't able to play in because of schedules right there's all that stuff then you have the tabletop stuff running so it really is this kind of like wow there's something something for everybody uh, something for everybody but you know, like I said, my my trip this time was a little bit um, limited. So Friday, I didn't do I didn't do much. I walked around. I kind of got the lay of it. Didn't really take any video. Um, I I did buy a shirt, merchandising shirt, which is somewhere, but it's too far away for me to get at the moment. Uh, and it's a neat thing. There's a you know you kind of the I will say I, I think I've mentioned so the the Boston Convention Center where this takes place. It's a convention center, okay, but it's a newer one. And so in terms of convention centers it's one of the nicer ones i guess i haven't been to that many there's the javits in new york here in new york city where they have new york comic con and it's just it's a, just a big block and you know it feels almost even though it's huge it feels kind of oppressive at, at times because it's just all it's not all enclosed but a lot of the inner where, where you are for the the big event spaces and kind of the exhibitor floor type spaces are pretty much feel very kind of boxy the uh, the Boston Convention Center, 
very tall ceilings, and it has essentially there's three floors, or maybe more, but the main floors where stuff is are basically three floors, and then th those floors kind of ring around the central exhibitor space, which has very tall ceilings, and then they have a glass like rim around the top right before the where the ceiling is, which just lets in natural light. It just feels more airy. It's still a big, you know, box essentially, or maybe a, a lozenge shape. But there's just something about it that I think having that natural, having that all the air come in, it just feels like very airy in there. And then having some having natural light, even though it was kind of a gray, cold, rainy weekend, just having that kind of natural light just come in, I feel like just makes it makes it feel less like you're in a cave, which is really good. In terms of stuff I did, I didn't do I didn't do that much. So Friday I ended up not doing very much at all because I was just because as the afternoon wore on, I was just getting kind of work worn out. I'm lugging around this bag. Um, my cousin's kind of playing his board games, and one of the things, and I was thinking about this, this is probably a good lesson. And I'm not going to say that I was look at me, but what I decided was. I knew I was just getting kind of tired and maybe a little bit cranky as I'm just kind of walking around. My shoulders are in pain. Uh, my, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like oh, everywhere I got to go. And I've been up since four o'clock. So by the time four o'clock runs around, hey, Dave, I'm, I'm already kind of a little bit zonkered. And I know my cousin's like, OK, he's not going to get done until like 10 or 11. And I'm just going to be and I'm just sitting around. But I thought I could get into a game. I'm not in the mood for a game. I'm not going to be a good player or, you know, whatever in, in the kind of game, unless it was whatever. I'm just, I'm tired. You know, I'm tired. I've been up super early. I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm not, I'm not kind of, I'm just not, not in the right headspace. So I didn't try. And I just thought like, you know what? I don't want to have other people have to put up, put up with me in a non kind of optimal state. You know, I want to play a game. I want to be in, I want to be in a good mind and, uh, I want to be in whatever. Oh, the intro music was super hot. That's that's a file. I've never had Drew. I've never had anybody let me know about the. I've never had anybody comment on the intro music being hot. Um, but thanks. I'll keep it in mind. I don't know. I just I just a file. I could try to remaster the file to make it lower, but no one's complained before. So I I, I do want to make new intro music or do a new intro scene. So maybe I'll add that to my list of things to do for that. Uh, Frederick asked, "Did I find anything I would run?" Well, Honey Heist, so on Saturday, I played Honey Heist, and that was a lot of fun. And that actually, on the side here, I don't know if I'll get into it, but it kind of inspired me to write up something kind of quickly. Maybe we'll get into that towards the end. Um, but uh, Honey Heist was a ton of fun. So there, here's how it works. They have, uh, there's uh, there's some D&D games playing. They have some kind of Adventures League, or I don't know if it's Adventures League. They have some D&D games in one area. In another area, they have, Pathfinder, and one day I'm gonna, I'm gonna, one of these cons I'm gonna sign up for this thing that's run by, I guess, Gehenna. I think it's Gehenna Gaming. I guess they do streaming. Someone let me know in the chat if they've ever done stuff with Gehenna or they watch Gehenna. I've seen them at the different PAXs, but I've, they say something like dark, but accessible, or I don't know, something like, but the, the dark part, maybe they're like, oh, what, what is, what are they, you know, I, it's not that I'm opposed to dark, but it's just for me. If dark is the main thing you're advertising, I'm thinking, okay, are we? It's maybe it's too dark. Like I'm not trying to be kind of. It feels like a, I don't know. It gives me kind of an emo sort of vibe. That's maybe like, eh, maybe more than I'm looking for. Uh, but so somebody let me know because they seem to be at all the different cons, the PAXs anyway, and they're always running games. And then you have a kind of a volunteer TTRPG section. Now, and I talked to some people online with it because I was like, I wish they had kind of online signups because you have to wait in line. So here's how it works in the indie one. Starting at, I want to say they start at 11 and then every hour pretty much through the day, different GMs are starting different games. And they usually, the GM, the prospective GM will have two games that they've brought with them. And so you'll, so they have a, a table section and you'll see Okay, here at 11 o'clock, we've got two, three, four, five, however many GMs. And each one of those GMs has two games. Now you get in the line. Whoever the first person in line is that picks a game, picks one of those GMs, gets to pick which game the GM runs. So let's just say, let's give an example. You see a GM and they have Morkborg and they've got Honey Heist sitting there. If you're the first person in line, you say, ooh, I want to run, I want to play in Honey Heist. So Honey Heist gets picked, Mork Borg goes off the board. 
Second person in line, if they go to a different GM, can pick two of those games that other GM's running. If they go to one of the play with that first GM, then it, now it's just Honey Heist. So there's this kind of interesting, interesting element in which it's you, you don't really know what you're going to get. You know, so when I was, so when I went in the morning, Saturday morning, I think it was at 11 a.m. slot, it was either, you know, there was a few games and there were some that I was interested in. But unfortunately, some of them was like, you're going to get one or the other. It, it was like, I, you know, Blades in the Dark or Scum and Villainy. But someone's going to pick one one of those. Or it might have been Honey Heist or Scum and Villainy. And I was like, ooh, Scum and Villainy, I could really try to play. And I'd heard funny things about Honey Heist. But you can also end up with, potentially, if you're later in the line, that let's say you had three out of the, say if there were six games up there, and there's three of them, that you're like, yeah, I really want to try those three. It's possible that all those games are off the board and you don't even get to pick them. So it's a little bit of you kind of got to take what you can or you just have to make sure you're first in line, in which case or very early in the line so that you get to have your have your choice. So it's kind of an interesting setup and there's no way to pre-register. There's no there's not, you know, you just before the time. And of course, the other thing is, is, okay, you have these time slots. If I get into an 11 hour game, that's four hours long. That obviously precludes me from the 12 o'clock, the one o'clock or the two o'clock games. Right. And then if there's other things going on at the con. Those times will also conflict with whatever else is going on. So there's a little bit of schedule maneuvering or just decisions you have to make of, okay, I'm going to do this, and then I'm not going to be able to do those, and then, I'm okay, I'm going right, to go do this one. So the 11 o'clock one, I get up there, and the, I'd heard things of good things about Honey Heist, and the person at the table was like, oh, yeah, Honey Heist is a lot of fun. You should try it. My cousin was there, and she was trying to get him to play, but he had a board game, one of his board game tournaments that was conflicting so he couldn't play but he even was kind of getting interested in playing it so i, I yeah i signed up like all right let's do it honey heist and it was a lot of fun it was i have i know that critical role did a honey heist playthrough i have not watched it maybe i'll go ahead and watch or at least watch some of it now now that i kind of know the game it's a super simple game you play a bear you roll for what kind of bear you are and the kind of bear you are gives you a power or an ability something i think the kinds of stuff were I was a grizzly bear, which and the grizzly bear had an intimidation power. Uh, the uh, I think it was someone played a um, uh, what was it a panda, and I think their power was if it looks like bamboo, they could eat it. So you know, and and and, and the game the the powers are not really explained, just as intimidate. And I I don't even get to look at the I don't know if there's a I mean I didn't have did not get to look at the whole rule book. So I don't know if, whether they have any rules for what these things mean, but it seemed like you just take it as kind of regular. Okay. I can intimidate things. Great. And you get a hat, which is just there for kind of show. So I was, uh, and then you get a, uh, like a descriptor. So I was a washed up grizzly, grizzly bear wearing a crown. That's it. And the, the, the premises is, is you are a real bear, not a cartoon bear, not some kind of uh, anthropomorphized bear. You are a bear. But you are a bear that that is both and has the, has an animal nature, but has also embraced criminality. So you have two basically stats. One is your bareness. One is your criminalness. And basically, they they oppose each other. So the more criminal you are, the less bear you are. The more bear you are, the less criminal you are. And you are uh, if you if you go too far bear, you just kind of you just you just. You lose your non-animal nature. That that criminal part that gives you maybe a little bit of a more intelligence, makes you more sapient, that's gone. And you're just total instinct bear. If you go to criminal, then you, now you're out for yourself. As now you're trying to jam every, everybody out. Um, and I guess originally in the game, the, 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 the way the, 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 way the get, person who was running the game, the referee, I guess, if you will, Kind of explained it that I guess by the book you're kind of eliminated from the game once you go once you you go too far, but that's not how he ran it. He ran it like well you know once you hit those poles, then you're just gonna you know when you're role playing stuff you just role play as a standpoint of you're a criminal or you're a bear kind of thing instead of doing the and you're not gonna roll instead of rolling now you're not gonna roll. You're just gonna do criminal or bear and and, and run. Um, Dave says it sounds like space monkeys on danger station. I mean, there probably are a bunch of different versions of this and types. Uh, if, I guess lasers and feelings is similar. Just you have like lasers and you have feelings. I don't know if they are the same thing where they oppose each other, but I mean, I've read it, but it's been a long time and I never, never played it. 
but it was it's it's a lot of fun and i'm glad that they changed it and i don't know how this would work in the game if you were eliminated from the game essentially if your bear went too far because it's very easy to go too far so when you start the game you use dice to track your your things which is kind of just tactile and saves you having to write and erase and rewrite and stuff so you, you know three for one three for the other now you have to you roll uh to do something Either you roll 1d6 or you roll 2d6 if you're using your bear ability. So if I'm a grizzly bear, I have this intimidation ability. If I'm rolling an intimidation ability, then I would roll 2d6 because that's kind of my bear specialty. Otherwise, I'm rolling 1d6. And then you just look to see if you are matching. Is it under? I can't remember. Was it under or over? It might be. Might be under. Yeah, it might be under. So three or less, I think. And then. Uh, and, and then you succeed. Now, the problem is, is when you succeed at something, your criminal goes up. Even if I'm going to intimidate something using a bear ability, your criminality goes up. So there's, so ideally in the game, you're supposed to kind of balance kind of what you're doing. So what happens is when your criminal goes up, your bear goes down. So you succeed on something. Okay, now I'm, so I, you start off at 3-3. Three, three, and we had, there's a prep phase. So it's a heist. So we get a prep kind of thing where you get the scenario, which in our case was that we were in some abandoned, private zoo just kind of chilling out and there's a, a some kind of other compound next door full of people doing yoga and kind of nature stuff and we discovered that they're having a big shipment of honey coming in and we decided to try to take get the honey that's the kind of the scenario so we have one sort of you know if you think about it in scenes or episodes we have the preparation episode and what we did was we tried to it was we, we were goofy because we kind of started off in one direction then decided to do something else so half the stuff we did in the prep didn't end up mattering at all we were like oh you know because we decided to steal another truck and then we we're gonna take the truck i think at my point at one point i said like well why don't we just take the truck that they're already using instead of loading having to load stuff on another truck and then we thought well maybe we'll use the truck as a decoy like we our ideas were all over the place but you get kind of one episode to do that so you're doing actions in that and i think oh what was it i did something and oh no I, oh yeah sorry there's one other thing i missed you also have a role so my bear was the face Meaning, so you have kind of a couple things you can do, right? You being the face, kind of being, you know, the face of the, to do kind of social stuff, even though I'm a bear, you're a bear. That also, you roll two dice. You roll two dice. Um, so I think I did something with that matter. So but anyway, by the time we've done the prep, some of us have succeeded on things. We're already for criminality, to bear. And then, uh, and some other, and I think, I think one person had failed. So they were, you know, for bear, to criminal. Something like that. So we did some stuff. You get that, and then you're just running it. And it's very loosey goosey kind of game, right? As the GM or the referee, you're really just things are happening. We're trying stupid, goofy stuff, and then you're just having stuff come down at us. And it's all very just kind of fun. So it moves lightning quickly. And as things are going on, you're either it kind of uh, in in the game sense when you're getting more bear, it's because you're getting frustrated, and it's like your bear angers are coming out where you're just gonna go berserk at the end of it, right? Or if you're you're becoming kind of more and more sapient in a sense until you, if you go full criminal, you kind of lose your bareness completely and you're just a hardened criminal. The one thing I felt like is me, I went criminal first. I just, I just, what happened was I ended up at, so the pl part of the plan was one part of us was doing these trucks. Now there's yoga classes and we're, the, 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 the honey is being kept in some kind of secure location and some special honey was being trucked in. And that's where I was thinking, well, why don't we just hijack the other truck? But we kind of ended up doing some kind of combo. So some of us were going to go try to infiltrate and do some things. So, we get, so one person, their role is a driver. One person's role is a hacker. One person's role is the muscle. One person's role is the face. That was me. And there's another one, the brains. So you end up with five tasks. So if you have five bears, which I guess we did, you kind of want to have one with each task. That way everybody gets to kind of be the, you know, the, the every, and there's a moment for everybody to sort of shine. Right. So it's going to be something like, ooh, that's definitely something the face would do. Or something, ooh, that's something that definitely the muscle would do. So you kind of do that, which I think is also pretty, pretty cool. Now, my, so I starting out, uh, so yeah, I starting out that, uh, the, just starting the day when we're actually doing heist, I'm already at four, four criminal, two bear. And then I had to do something. Oh, and so then I had to help the guy get on. So I was, so we had, the, we had the driver who's trying to drive the truck. That's that everybody's sneaking in the truck, sneaking to get into this compound. 
And I had to do like a face move because we had to go through a, a gate, a security gate with this truck. And there's obviously two bears in the front seat of this truck. And we hand them some horrible ID and I had to make a roll as a face and I succeeded. Now I'm just starting out. We're on basically scene two. I'm already five criminal now, one bear. And we're only in the second scene. So now my, uh, my particular task, my part of the plan after that was, so we have a compound. People were going to wait, and then I was going to go scare the bejesus, again, using my intimidate ability, scare the bejesus out of some yoga people, people doing yoga. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to go, and I'm just going to go full grizzly and just scare the crud out of them. And that is going to bring security out of the compound, which would let the other bears come into the compound, right? So that was, that was kind of my part of it. I'm the distraction. I'm five. I am five criminal, one bear. Now, my, now it, obviously, this wasn't part of the planning. I have very low on bear. So odds are I'm going to fail, right? I've got an 80 whatever percent chance of failing. But ha -ha, I rolled a one. So I succeeded and I went full criminal. And it would have felt really weird to me if the guy had said, like, oh, give me your sheet. You're done because you went full criminal. But so I'm glad that if that is a change and I'll have to read the rules, the real rules to see what the deal is. But like, because it seemed like kind of easily you can end up going kind of over the line and you don't really even really mean to. Uh, and even though, you know, I was, you know, you try your best to kind of, because, you know, you want to try to stay balanced a little bit so that you don't flip too far. But the way we played it is like, okay, now I'm full criminal. And I explained that when the security is coming out, I'm actually going to try to run them back to the, uh, I'm going to try to run them back to the compound so that they can, uh, you know, hopefully the other bears and the security, and then I'll be like the last bear standing. That ended up being my plan. So that's kind of happening. The other bears are in the compound. They're getting stuck with there's some kind of uh, knockout gas. And then this kind of, <laughs> this is kind of funny. I don't know if the guy meant it like this or what, but you know, this kind of big bad, the big bad guy kind of steps out of somewhere kind of clapping, you know, and the, the polar bear was there. And I don't, the polar bear's special ability was they could swim. But the polar bear just goes like, I just, you know, I just, kill him i just <laughs> i just attack the guy and just and so the the bad guy's kind of doing this about to give this grand speech he's doing the slow cap and about to say ah i'm glad you're all here and then just the, the bear just bear just tears him to shreds uh and then we had some fun kind of misadventures with trying people trying to get up try, the bears trying to carry barrels of hunting underneath their arms and then we're kind of trying to get on the truck and we ended up actually most of us getting away and then you know we get to kind of then there's an epilogue where essentially you say what happens and the you know, the couple of bears were had had were in. I was I was holding on to the top of the truck, and a couple of bears were in the truck with the honey. So I decided that my epilogue was that uh, because of all the the chaos and horror that happened at that compound, that it was abandoned. That I went and took over the compound, waiting for more honey to be delivered. And of course, no honey was. So it was sort of a uh, as someone mentioned when I, I I posted this after the game. This it was a very kind of Scorsese ending of this kind of grizzly bear with his crown and like sitting on some kind of thrown in this empty compound waiting for deliveries of honey that are not going to arrive the driver just took the took the truck and kept kept on driving uh one of the the, the honey badger decided to just kill the ones who remained in their sleep but then that one that was left was already dead from diabetic shock from just over over o overdosing and honey so i guess that could be another sort of scorsese kind of moment very very fun game i could see it being something super easy to pull out and play if you're, you know, if it's, if you're having a game night and you're a couple people are here and someone's running late or doing something, uh, I could totally see just saying, Hey, let's play honey heist. You could get it up and running really fast. You roll a couple of dice to just get these things. Oh, I'm a grizzly bear. I'm wearing a crown. I'm washed up and I'm when you, you know, the roll kind of thing. And then it's so, e you know, the thing is, and it's just very easy to just riff off some kind of thing. Oh, well, you know, whatever you're doing this, you're doing that. And you know, cause you're not worried about and really worried about anything. Um, you're not. It, this is not a game with death is on the line. So you know, even, it, you know, and that might be something that I suppose you could play it with because, like the, the the bears that were ingesting the gas, they was kind of making them woozy, but it had no mechanical effect. But the game is really not about that. It's not trying. You know, you're not trying to simulate all this stuff. It's really just about kind of having fun. So I was like, oh, you feel woozy, and people were playing into it like, oh, I'm doing this or that, and I'm, you know, I'm. I'm just going to town and they're, you know, at the end of the day, a couple of us were criminal. The polar bear had gone full feral bear. So it was just like tearing all these security guards to shreds. I think the driver, yeah, the driver might've been, no, there might've been one other bear that didn't go full bear or, or full criminal. 
um you know but it was just it, it was a lot of fun and it was short you know we played it and we we finished in less than two less than two hours i think we were done you know from like just sitting down and then just getting started playing and you know him walking us through the rules and he he went through uh you know how everything works and he had two kind of printouts which maybe it seemed like they were kind of official from the game which is great because you just need the one sort of out for all the characters just to or the players to roll on and then he just rolled a couple dice for some stuff for the scenario but i think he might have had his own in mind and then it's just like bam you don't even need names like i didn't even name my character right no 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 backstory i'm not worrying about any about that it's like oh i'm, I'm washed up whatever it is I've, I've seen too much so it was a lot of fun i i, I enjoyed that a lot i would definitely i guess i would definitely say i recommend it um I, like i said if you watch the critical role one and I don't know if you liked or disliked it. I would definitely say, regardless of how you felt about it, maybe, you know, give it a try next time you're somewhere. Or I don't know if you can download it somewhere. Maybe I'll do a read of it on the channel. It feels like it'd be a really short read, but uh, super a lot of fun. Now, the problem came up for me in terms of the con that, you know, you're at timing again. So I'm looking back at the table and I'm like, okay, well, what's coming up next? And I'm looking at the times. I'm also looking at other things to do. I'm also thinking I got to eat lunch. And it's easy to lose track of time a little bit. And so I missed, so there were some ones in the afternoon, but when it got later in the afternoon, I decided, so my cousin likes, so every night at PAX, they have these, they call them different names. Like it's like Friday, something, it's like Thursday, I don't know, they have like, it's like, was Saturday Smackdown or something, Saturday Showdown or Thursday Throwdown, Friday F Down, <laughs> whatever, right? they have different names for it, but they see these, you know, these tournaments, things they do where you play over multiple rounds, different games in the night. I think, and I knew that my cousin, because he does them every night, is going to do them. And I thought, I'd never gone to an Acquisitions Incorporated, the live show. I've watched them on YouTube. I'll put them on in the background sometimes. I find them, um, I find them enjoyable when I'll throw them on in the background and just kind of, as I'm doing something else, maybe not paying 100% attention to it, just kind of doing it. And I, so I decided to do that. And that one starts at eight, but I knew that if I wanted to get this is where I kind of messed myself up. I thought I want to get a decent seat. So I'm going to, I know I'm going to have to stand out early. Um, so it starts at eight and like, okay, it's like, so it's like six, six 30. I'm like, I'm going to probably want to get in the line, right? The lineup. And I for sure was not the first person. They, they, they kind of fill up the room, the waiting area to go into this auditorium by columns. And I was halfway through like the second column. And I have no idea how big the I had no idea how big the theater is, so I didn't know how many you know how many seats what that meant. So I was like, okay, and I actually just sit there and fiddled on my iPad for a bit. But that also meant that it kind of took me out of the action because it's not just that. Oh, okay, if I'm going to go sit at six thirty or go wait in line so I can't play a game at six thirty, it means that I really can't play a game from like three onwards because those games, some of them are three or four o'clock. Five o'clock. Some of those games are some of those games are four hours long, three four hour slots. So I can't play those games. So there's I ended up in this kind of a little bit of a uh, of a no man's land of of scheduling where I'm looking. I'm going, oh, I like oh, I could play another game after I eat lunch and walk around a little more. But now it's like, well, this is a three o'clock game and it's but it's a four hour window and that's gonna be seven. It's gonna be too late and I need to eat. You know, I'm not gonna I'm gonna be in this auditorium from eight to eleven. So I have to eat before then. It's like, well, that means that basically if, if, the, if, you know, it just limits your options. So there was, so I don't know if I would go see a show another time and, and I'll talk about the show. I actually thought the show was, was really good, but just because either that or just be okay with sitting like in the back, which I actually think is okay. I think if you're going to go to one of those acquisitions live shows, you might as well sit in the back. There's no advantage to being up close. They haven't posted on YouTube yet, and I'm pretty sure I'm in the shot of the when they do these crowd shots. I'm in them, um, but because the 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 issue is just from uh, or at least, and I don't know if they do them in different. If you're in different packs, there might be different setups. The setup at PAX East is that you know you're in a theater, right? So that the seats are all sloping down. So the seats towards the front, where I was, are below the level of the stage, which isn't always true, but a lot of times it's true when you have it stage shows but the stage is elevated and this one's elevated a fair amount then you have the that's the stage floor then they have the table set up and they actually have kind of a big acquisition corporate kind of plaque in front of it then they're seated around the table 
So if you're in those first few rows, and I don't even know if there is somewhere in the theater where you could actually see with any resolution the top of the table. They have cameras that are set up at kind of angles looking down from this from this kind of sides. So they can, you know, you have one camera shooting at the people on one side of the table, the other camera shooting at people on the other side of the table. And I suppose there's one shooting the GM who's in the middle. And then I think they might have some other cameras for more detail. Yeah, they just have one other camera that shows a shot of the when they had a battle map. You know, they use Dwarven Forge kind of battle maps, which are nice. And so they'll have that a, a kind of a camera for that. You can't see anything. Like I was seeing on the side where I guess Jerry Holkins and um, I forget the other lady, the lady's name sitting next to him, but I can only kind of see him and it's only his side. And then he's normally turned towards the GM, which means he's facing away from me. I can see just maybe the head of the GM when he's sitting down anyway. If he, if he was standing up at times, I could see him a little bit better, but still, you end up spending most of your time not looking at the stage, but looking at these big screens they have on either side of the stage that are projecting the image, presumably the recording image that they're recording. So it's giving you the points of view. So you're kind of, I'm sitting almost center stage, but then I'm sort of doing this a lot kind of thing. So if it's like that at other PAXs, I would say you might as well sit in the back because it's not really going to affect, affect your view. I mean, sure, you're not as close to them, I guess, if you just want to be close to them, catch their sweat in your hands, I suppose. but. Other than that, there's really no, no real advantage to it. it. Just you know, you have to wait a long time to sit because you have to be there early, and then you know you're kind of at the back of the back of the queue, getting out. Uh, they have a fun, you know, they do a whole riff on sort of the movie, the sort of pre, the, the older ones, the kind of classic ones where they had some like cheesy CGI. I think the one from Regal used to be, you know, where it was like you're like on a a uh, roller coaster cart and popcorns popping around you and also they do a nice riff on that they do kind of a pre thing where they put like goofy trivia and jokes up on the screen it's all good they start the show pretty much on time and jeremy crawford i think is the gm and what's interesting is i've enjoyed him when i've seen him on these acquisitions incorporated things i thought oh he's you know i've, I've enjoyed him and it's funny so i was thinking about it that because he's the one who writes a lot of those Sage Advice. Now, granted, Sage Advice is not written for me. It's written for 5e folks, about 5e issues. But a couple of times I've read it, and I know I made a video about at least one of them, just seem like these things are goofy. And sometimes I've, when I've seen, run into conversations about 5e, and they'll bring up some of the stuff on critic, on the Sage Advice, it feels like, man, there's some goofy stuff going on there. And like I have not understood some of the thinking, the reasoning behind some of those Sage Advice columns and their answers. But, in in terms of GMing these games, he, he he does an excellent job. He is very good. And the one thing I, I just was thinking about it when I was getting up to leave, the show ended basically on time, <clears throat> like eleven o'clock. It's a wrap. So it's you know the the, the show is officially from eight to eleven. Starts a little bit after eight because they do a couple of little commercial bits, kind of they do a little intro video, and then people come out and sit down. So. A little bit after eight, you know, the the actual maybe even eight twenty, you're actually starting to play the game, and then you know right around eleven they're ending it, but it ends at eleven. And when we were getting up, when I was getting up to leave, and I don't know if I should, I don't, I'm gonna try not to spoil it, okay? But it's clear that the players did at least one thing that was not in the plan, and he mentioned as much in the video, like, boy, you guys did something I did not think you were gonna do. And yet the game still ended on time. And I imagine that if they had, and, and then thinking about it, like what they, they didn't do, like the other option, the kind of, you look at, and there's the unexpected thing, which they did. And then there's the standard thing they did. The standard thing would have taken up just in terms of resolution time, a fair bit longer. But I imagine that if it had taken a fair bit longer, he probably still would have managed to get the game over in the allotted time and it just made me think like he's really good at having he must have a really good i don't know if there are people i mean there may be people in his ear saying hey you know you got a half hour left you got an hour left whatever you have but he must have a good kind of internal clock because the players aren't moving particularly quickly there's lots of jokes and quips and things like that but then they'll do something that then you know if there was you know say you would if, imagine if you were running a con game and you have four or five blocks that you think, okay, I got these four or five blocks of things, right? 
in the scenario. I've got the town part. I've got the dungeon level one, dungeon level two, dungeon level three, and then the party somehow bypasses dungeon level one. And they're like, "Oh gosh, what am I gonna do?" Like somehow, you know, he had it kind of, you know, he he figured out how to make things work to keep the time, <clears throat> which is pretty impressive. And I ever got a chance to, if I ever got a chance to, to, to talk to him, I'd probably ask him about that. Cause I feel like that's a really, especially for con games, for stream games, things like that. It's like, now you had this time and you got through it. Obviously it's for streaming. So, you know, the, it's not the same kind of challenges necessarily that a home GM would have in those situations. Because they're all playing, they know, you know, it's there as a performance, right? There's a performative aspect about it. So you don't get people doing just like super goofy, selfish, or self-absorbed, maybe is a better word, things and wasting time, right? Doing just inanities. But clearly there's a there there there's some uncertainty in what things are gonna do, even though it's fairly linear. It is a pretty linear thing, so that I'm sure helps. But I was like, okay, well, they just they just popped out this whole section, and that section. Probably would have taken up some time. So I was curious, like, I wonder how the game would have ended. How would he have ended the game if they had done that segment? Because then in the same token, if in this, if having not done it, he maybe had to stretch things out a bit, though it, it wasn't apparent. I didn't, it didn't feel stretched out to me. Then I'm curious, well, if he had had to do it, would he have had to compress something? Would something else have been left out? Where would have ended? But it was a lot of fun. And they're all very funny. They do very funny things and i think the other interesting thing was there was a, a moment in the game i'm gonna have to say what the spell was but i'm not gonna say the context of it it was I, you know and, and i wonder this makes me wonder too when people so i know that i don't think acquisition incorporates as popular let's say as critical role i know it's not okay you could see the crowd anyway was was there was a funny bit so one of the characters pulls out charm person and as soon as they did you could just feel everybody in the audience was like because they were trying to charm a monster it wasn't a person and me and everyone else is like she's going through this whole thing and it's very funny and clever but everyone's going like she's doing all this it's like but that's not you're not charming a person you're charming a monster it's not going to work i mean there's even probably another reason why there was even another reason why i think it wouldn't work but uh I'm 99% sure there are actually two reasons it wouldn't work. The monster part being one. In any case, uh, you know, you're like, oh gosh, what's, what are they going to, you know, what's going to happen? This is an interesting kind of GM test, right? You were the GM. Your players just gone through and done this amazing bit of role play that's inventive and it's funny and everyone at the table's into it. But at the same time, everyone at the table's like, uh, probably thinking of themselves like, it's not the right spell. So what do you do? I think you see a lot of times already, oh, just rule of cool it, right? Oh, rule of cool kind of thing. Or there are other kind of curmudgeon GMs who are like, well, that's the spell description plainly states, blah, blah, it's person, not monster. Therefore, it's not going to work. Well, he didn't really do either one of those. Now, it just so happened that he was able to pick out something in the context of the situation, which I'm not going to spoil, that, that allowed him to give a little bit of leeway to it. But he didn't just say like, oh, well, because this MacGuffin is here, it works. He didn't do that. What he said was because of the presence of this MacGuffin, <clears throat> you can roll a d20. And if you roll 18 or higher, you'll, you'll get it. So she still only had 15% chance to do it. But it, it automatically just made it a little bit just kind of better. Like, oh, she's got it. Oh, oh yeah, because this thing, which made sense. It wasn't like he just said, oh, because there's a candle in the room, you can do it. No, it was something that in the context of the moment, you could actually look and say, yeah, I get it. <clears throat> As another player, GM, like, yeah, I can go with that, right? I want, you know, because you're thinking, I, I wanted, this player just went through this whole thing. I want to throw them a bone, but I don't also want to set a precedent or do whatever, but, oh, there's this thing, right? There's a you know, if we had established, let's just say that there's some weird magical energy in the air. This is an area of magical uncertainty. And then they pull out the spell and you're like, ah, it's not the right spell. But you go look at, oh, but there's this weird aura of magical uncertainty. Therefore, maybe that can have an effect and allow in this one spot at this one time for the spell to act in a certain way. It's like, I can do that, right? Because that's not something that is... Uh, is, is easily repeatable or spammable or 
um, abusable because you're just not going to run in these situations all the time. So like, yep, yeah, I can, we can do that. And then he gave her a percent, right? And then it wasn't a gimme. He's like, well, you got to roll. Roll was not made. But then he threw another bone. He was like, okay, this other effect happens instead, which kind of made you feel as the, as the player, it's like, I didn't get what I was trying to do, but I got something else. And it wasn't something that helped her immediately in the situation, but it was a fun little bit that they got that kind of took the sting out a little bit of, I mean, and I'm sure like, as a performer, I say, take the sting out. I'm, I mean, as, as a regular player might, I'm sure as a performer, they're fine with it, right? They're, that's part of the gig, but just as a player, you peel back the performative aspect a little bit. Just look at as, as a player, you put your heart and soul in this bit, in this moment. <clears throat> Technically, the moment doesn't work. But the GM says, you know what? I'm going to I'm gonna throw your bone in a way that, you know, you're, you're kind of understanding. And this is sort of a one-time deal. Still, the odds are against you. But go ahead and roll that die and see if, if, you, can, if you can roll really well. Then these, this confluence of factors, one-time deal will allow this thing to go beyond what it normally does. Oh, you didn't get it. Okay, well, then what you're trying to do doesn't work, but I'm going to throw you this other little bone. And so you kind of get that. And it, it wasn't something that helped in the moment. It wasn't like, oh, but you did a little thing. It was just something else, just a little side thing. But I can see it, but I feel like as a player, that would make you feel kind of okay. Like, you know what I got? I got something. It wasn't, and it wasn't anything like, you got a magic item now. Oh, you have a... That didn't work, but now you have a plus five shield. No, it wasn't anything like that. It didn't, it did not feel to me like, oh, they were trying to, I don't know. Cause I feel like, I feel like oftentimes players, at least the way they're portrayed sometimes, like they can't, can't have defeat. Well, you know, this bad thing happened. So I gotta, I gotta give them a prize or I gotta make it. And that wasn't really it. It was just a matter of, you know, and I'm rewarding this effort that you're doing in a way more of like a character, almost more like a, uh, I don't know. It wasn't exactly the same, but imagine something kind of cosmetic changes or something where it doesn't really affect anything. It's not a mechanical thing, but it's something to kind of like, it's something to sort of memorialize the moment when you tried this thing and it, and it didn't work. It's not, it's not something that makes your character stronger in any appreciable way, but it's something to kind of remember. It's like you get a little souvenir for, for doing it. And it felt good. And I was like, that's something that would be kind of interesting to play around with this idea of a kind of a souvenir. You did something, you had the best of intentions. You didn't quite read the spell description right. So it was kind of doomed, almost doomed to failure from the start. But you, you really went into it full bore. And so you know what? I'm going to, if I can give you a shot, I will. And barring that, here's a little kind of memento. I thought that was really, I thought that was really good. Um, everybody's funny. It's a lot of fun. You know, they do a three hour session live and they, it kind of go. It, the time goes by pretty quickly. I know there's sometimes they went to the crowd shot and I'm looking at my phone or I'm doing something like that. I was also getting kind of, I can't, I'm getting tired because <clears throat> we're getting there early every time. So like we're getting home late and we're getting out and we're getting out early. So I'm constantly feeling like I'm sort of fighting against uh, sleep deprivation. But it was a lot of fun and and it and, and did exactly what I wanted to was made gave me an enjoyable time. I hadn't, I hadn't watched them again. Like I said, I don't know if I would watch it again only because it does take up a big amount of time. And it was a bunch of other things you want to do at the con. And it's maybe your first con unless you're dying to see the show. It is nice to have it live. I was going to say it's the, you get the same experience watching at home. Not quite. It is fun to be there with a bunch of people who are all enthusiastic, all yelling out green flame uh, and, and sort of getting into it and laughing at the moments. And like I said, when we realized, everyone realized that this character was casting the wrong spell. You can almost hear everybody going, <gasps> kind of that little hissing of breath, like, oh no, it's going the wrong way. Um, so that is that is additive. It's not the same as watching it home. But you know, if if it's not also awful, uh, you know, it's not like a huge downgrade either. So it's a fun thing. I've been to a few packs now, so I guess it was it was fine to do it. And like I said, I when when I start getting starting to get tired and stuff, it's like I don't want to learn a new game when I'm not right into it. Uh, you know, I don't want to be crabby or not sort of hyped up for everybody. So it was fun. It was fun. Um, it was a good, a good time. And then Sunday, Sunday day day, uh, was pretty quiet. I went and I talked, which I posted today early in the channel. I went and Free League was there because they're pretty much all the PAXs, or at least they're PAX East, they're PAX Unplugged. And that guy, Doug, who was the one who was talking today on camera, he's just a really nice guy. So I go and I talk to him. Uh, you know, I'm walking around the floor. There's another video I took 
of um who of um shoot what's the what's the what's the uh what was it the game um God, what was it what was it what was it what was it um Man, I'm trying to remember the game. I talked, I filmed somebody else. Who was it? Oh, man, I do not recall. I did two interviews. I did Doug over at Free League, and then I talked to... Oh, it was about a game called Castaway. I don't remember the person's name. I'm going to have to look, it, I'll have to look up their name. Uh, a Mork board game called Castaway. And they were really nice too. They uh, they had uh, so I, I guess they're they were kind of ended up in the shadow because of Pirate Borg because Pirate Borg came out about the same time. And while their Kickstarter was very successful, relatively speaking, you know, it was kind of in the shadow of, of Pirate Borg. But you know, they've had a lot of people who bought their game who were totally run it with Pirate Borg because it's actually a really good connection because Castaway is all about you're you know you're you're shipwrecked on some island and dealing with all that stuff and of course if you're doing pirate borg i feel like there's got to be a more than zero percent chance that you're going to end up shipwrecked so you could easily meld the two together like oh you started off in pirate borg you fought something you shouldn't have fought shipwrecked now you're in now we're playing content from castaway uh, so i talked to them so i have a little just kind of quick video from them it's i'll have to figure out something because right now i'm doing everything on the show floor I probably need to evolve a little bit with maybe trying to get people off the show floor so I can have more Q&A type stuff because it's really hard. The way the camera is, and I need to get a better, a little bit, I have to upgrade. Not, I have to figure out my setup a little better because right now I have a, I have a camera, I have a camera, I have a mic on top of the camera and I have the mic, it's like a little mini shotgun mic and it's pointed at my subject. So I get them kind of clearly and it's, you know, kind of reducing, you know, it's focused in. Now I am behind the camera or maybe I'm to the side of the camera slightly, which means that usually these kinds of microphones, they are trying to, uh, I don't know, maybe dampens, reject sound that's off axis. So if the camera, the, the microphone and the camera pointed over here, usually this area behind the camera and Depending on the type of microphone capsule, some of the, the width of the side and kind of that, that sort of 360. So when I'm behind the camera and I'm asking a question, it's rejecting a lot of my voice. You may, if you watch some of those videos and you wonder like why my voice sounds a little bit different or it's very less in volume, it's very much less in volume. That's why it's because the mic has which is what it's good for is, hey, I don't want to capture all the sound coming out behind us. I want to get my subject, but then I'm back there. So what I need to figure out is maybe a little bit of a better kind of two mic setup or do something where I can capture my voice a little bit and then have either have a handheld mic for me and then have that, the, the, the shotgun mic on them or something like that. And I saw some people do it where they had either sharing one microphone or giving them giving the other person a microphone. I just don't have that yet. So that's something that maybe I'll do going going um, forward. And then part of that also would be like, I'd like to figure out, okay, can I lure some folks away for a few minutes? It's something like Free League. I could probably do it because Free League, they have three or four people. So one person can leave. So I could probably say, hey, Doug, can you want to step over here where it's more quiet? And maybe I can actually ask more questions, something like that. Um, I talked to... Who I guess was at ShireCon, and we've kind of crossed paths or almost crossed paths a bunch of times. And as he reminded me, we had set up to meet at PAX Unplugged a couple of years ago, and it didn't happen. But um, uh, it's uh, one of my spacing out on um, uh, Brian Shutter, I think his name is the, the creator of Neon Lords of the Toxic Wasteland. So he was there, and I didn't know what he looked like. And, he, and then when I finally ran into him, he was he was running a booth for Goodman Games there, and Goodman Games is now distributing Neon Lords of the Toxic Wasteland. And I had no idea that it was the same person, but I was just going up to look at the Goodman Games stuff and maybe talk to someone Goodman Games. And suddenly it's like, oh, hey, like we were supposed to meet up. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I know. I don't actually work for Goodman Games. I wrote Neon Lords of the Toxic Wasteland. It's so like, oh, okay, okay. We met up. 
but he was working all alone at the booth. Um, so I got his card and we'll make contact. So I'll have him on the stream, hopefully sometime this week to chat stuff. And that is where, if you saw it, I bought, um, they did a, uh, hold on a minute. Let me see if I can reach over and grab it. So they, uh, they are, uh, hold on, let, the, uh, Goodman Games is putting out kind of this dark tower line. And one of them they put out is called By Mitra's Bones Meet Thy Doom. And they put the kind of Janelle Jacquet's memorial sort of cover on that. So I picked that up. They have a few different, a couple different covers of it, but I picked up this one. This is the inside. Got that. And then. The adventure proper. I, I really didn't didn't bring much back. Uh, I didn't ask for anything. I didn't I didn't really buy much because I just I knew that I had to lug everything everywhere. I was like, I don't want to care. I, if I bought something big or someone want to give me something, I, I just don't want to get it home. Like, how am I going to get this thing home? But I did buy that. I mean, you know, it's, this I can carry. Um, and then I was just kind of winding down, and then I had to get over to the back to the bus station. And then get out of Dodge. And that was pretty much my packs. It was cold. It was cold. And then Saturday was really rainy. Got, a, got not quite soaked, but got pretty darn wet. Hauling uh, across town. Uh, taking Because we, we were, uh, he lives, my cousin lives not right near the convention center. I mean, who wants to live right near a convention center anyway? Anyhow, we got to take the T, which is their trans, their kind of subway. And the subway station that he's on, it's a little bit of a haul. It's like three quarters of a mile or a mile away, which, you know, city-wise, I don't mind it, but when it's raining and it's cold and you're, and you're carrying heavy things, it becomes a little bit more of a barrier. They had, they, the, the food options are not terrible, but uh, they had some food trucks that were outside, but when you do the ones, food trucks outside, you have to go through security, and when I was lugging around my heavy bag, the idea of going through security because I got called over to have my bag, ex bag examined every single time. That wasn't really an option for me other than Sunday when I was finally able to get a locker and secure my bag. But they had some good food truck options. They had this, your kind of regular, I feel like, uh, stadium slash uh, convention center food. And they had a couple other things. Uh, but altogether, all fairly decent options. Oh, Brian Smith says, uh, the Tales of Starcadia looked fun. They checked out the trailer. Uh, I had, I did not play. I didn't play. I didn't play any of the computer games. I feel weird. I probably I should probably figure out what to do because this is something that there's a <laughs> this is something like so from a I'm doing a poor job as a YouTuber and here's why I am in video. I like video games. I've been playing video games all my life. I enjoy them. I haven't gotten to play much lately, but I do in principle enjoy video games. They're not really what this channel is for, as you well know. And what happens is when I post some video game stuff. I think it futzes up the things because it gets gets eyeballs on it who are not interested in anything else that I'm doing but the video games. I feel like it probably, if, if someone were to come at me from like a marketing, if I were trying to market myself seriously, I, they would probably say like, get those video game things the heck off your channel because um, they're not they're not helpful. Because I think you know a bunch of people come and they watch the Tales of Starcadia short, and then they see the rest of the stuff on my channel <laughs> about playing hex crawls. And uh, OSR kind of stuff, and it's like, what the f, right? It doesn't does not compute. Uh, and and I remember I, I have some that I filmed a few things I filmed ages ago, and every once in a while they'll resurface and go like get on these mini runs, but they don't help me because they're about some video games that I saw, and I just took like a little short of somebody playing the video game. But you know, I kind of can't help myself because I'm just in the moment, and I'm like, oh yeah, look, I'm I'm here. I'm just I'm seeing it. Maybe I should do some more. I, I don't know, or maybe I do another channel where I play video games where I would never, the channel would be empty because I don't get a really chance to play anything. Anyhow, I'm saying all that to say that I feel weird if I'm like, because if, if I, with this content creator badge, right, when I'm watching someone play a game, it, it, it's, you have the people who are the, either the publishers or the actual people who design the game. They're there. They're at the booth. Um, especially if it's a smaller kind of game, it's usually the people who created the game. And like they come to me, right? They're like, oh, you know, and I just feel, I just feel weird about it. Cause I know there are a couple of times where the guys like would let me cut the, you know, cause you have a whole line of people and I'm standing there. He's like, oh, would you like to play? Like he'll like shovel me into the game. 
And I'm always like, no, man, I'm just, I enjoy watching. And the reason is I don't want to waste their time, right? I'm not, I mean, I'm not a big influencer anyway, but to the extent that I have any kind of anything, it's not video games. So this person spending time with me, putting me at the front of the line, uh, you know, or doing whatever to play the game, to run me through. It's like, it's not a, it's a, it's like, it's a waste of their time, right? It's not, and it's not because I'm not personally interested in it. Cause oftentimes I'm like, yeah, please. And just as a person, I would love to hear more about the game. But if you're looking at me, the fact that I have content creator on my badge, thinking that I'm going to take this and turn this into an article or a video and put it up there. It's like, it's not happening. I don't have a place for it yet. Maybe I will at some point, maybe I should, but I don't. Um, so I tend to not play the games and I, cause I just don't want to send out a signal that like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm into this. And you know, we're, we're like, we've got, you know, the, like I'm going to cover this or something cause I'm not. So I tend, I tend not to, to do that uh, as much as sometimes I want to, like, I kind of wanted to play that killer clowns, but the lines were long and I really did enjoy just watching it. And that one where the, 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 the knights fighting each other also was, seemed kind of fun though it felt kind of limited as well i don't know because there were some older games i remember where they'd have this where you just had two guys you know almost like a fighting game but much more limited and much kind of slower because you're like you know but it was just kind of fun just hacking at each other brian smith says they appreciate a real human with broad interests you know i i i appreciate that too and i think you get to a certain point where you can do that like uh i don't know to use an example like matt colville right he could run videos on talking about Dune or talking about running role-playing games or talking about card game design or playing a video game or playing a board game. Uh, and I'd love to get to a spot where I could do that because I do have all this interest in talking about coffee and stuff, right? Um, and it's not, and look, if I were a real marketer, I would be doing things differently. I'm not, I'm very <laughs> inefficient. I'm very inefficient in my efforts if I was trying to just max maximize stuff but at the same token i don't want to have somebody go down the, the path of treating me like i'm covering the game or something when i'm not dave says i can make another channel called hexed digital I, I could maybe or digital press i don't know did you hex hex code oh hex code might have to try that and there are other uh because there was a new york because yeah it was like a new york kind of video gamey sort of convention where I post this one video and it still every once in a while picks up views and stuff. And I'm like, I don't know why people keep pulling this up because it was a minute video of a game that's like five years old. Uh, you know, but it happens. So maybe, maybe I will. And I would, you know, maybe I'll get to a place where I'll have time to actually play some video games or something like that. But you know, I, I enjoy them. And that is, like I said, PAX East has that going for it. I presume PAX West and some of the other are similar where if you have someone who has interest, because that's kind of the neat thing, right? I guess I said this at the beginning, I'll just reiterate it, is it's kind of this neat element of, and I don't know if it's the PAXs are particularly unique in this, but maybe they are, in that it's not just all board games, it's not just all role-playing games, it's not just all video games, it's kind of this confluence of all of them. So you can spend over your three or four days that you're there, you could go around doing video games, and they had all kinds of stuff. They had, you know, classic video games, they had, uh, Steel, I don't know if you ever remember Steel Battalion, which was this kooky thing that back in the day for, I think, the Xbox One cost like $250. It had a whole full, it was like a very uh, simulation kind of mech game where it had its own console and stuff. And it was crazy and it was super niche, but someone's got a bunch of them. And at least on the PAX, every PAX East, they have a thing there where you play four on four uh, of steel battalion and I, I watched my cousin play it last time it's just amazing to watch so you have all this stuff here but they also have escape rooms and then they have you can play indie role-playing games you can play you know big market role-playing games you can play board games they have people there developing board games where you can play board games that are not out yet that are kind of in the works you can get demos on different board games you get all this stuff under one roof which is pretty darn neat Pretty neat. And I don't know where else you can kind of, I don't know where else you can get that. And I imagine PAX Prime or PAX West, whatever they call it now, is probably the same in Seattle. I imagine. Um, but the other part's really fun. And I think for myself, like for my daughter, right? My daughter, if we just took her to a board gaming convention or role-playing game convention, she might not make it. 
her interest she might her interest might wane but when she could play video games or go play just dance and then play a board game you know there's like you know you can really kind of please a bit of everybody when i was asked if i saw geek knights there they're northeast dudes been podcasting doing game stuff for ages i don't know there are some other content creators who i've seen periodically and i just i just don't recognize them or don't know them so i didn't i didn't see anybody because people don't there's there's one group that they're all wearing they have jackets or shirts that have their names and they all have these weird names i couldn't there's one guy's like uh lord it's like lord something or something like i saw one guy's like lord king david there's some other guy lord whatever i didn't know what they meant but they were all part of one crew um but I didn't see, but people aren't usually going around just emblazoning things like with, you know, <laughs> waving flags or banners with their creator names. Unless I knew faces to go with identities, I would not have recognized them. But uh, hey, Sulza, glad to, glad to see you. So that was that. So really quickly. So I guess I'll, uh, oh, it's just Scott and Rim, two dudes. Okay. Well, if uh, do you know them personally, Brian Smith, or are you just followers? You just enjoy their stuff. Um, I'll have to check them out because maybe I did see them and I did not even know. So one of the things was I was I was I was really impressed with Honey Heist. I just was a lot of fun, and when the first, and I and I I kind of I don't know tweeted or whatever social media it over the weekend afterwards. Or I think I might have talked about it on Discord. Oh, long time listener. Okay. Um, that I thought, like, is there one of these for kind of just a, a D&D, sort of D&D-ish, sort of a classic fantasy version of Honey Heist? And some people point out that there might be some. And, and I wasn't looking for just a, I wasn't looking for just a, a, a re, what do you call it? Just a, a new, like, I wasn't looking for just like, oh, take Honey Heist and just, theme it i wasn't looking for a retheming i was looking for something a little bit different same idea but maybe a little bit different so i started just kind of thinking about it and i just started writing things down and so i i kind of have created and i'm trying to put the finishing touches on it today this kind of uh play test version of a really super simple kind of thing which i because you know i think the other thing was that honey heist reminded me it was tuned I had some, I had a ton of fun playing tune back in the day and it had a similar kind of thing to a tune is more competitive, you know, honey heist until you go all criminal or all bear, you're, you're all working as a team or as tune. It's more competitive in, in that you really kind of work. It's, you know, if you want someone is basically bugs, bunny, someone else is Daffy duck and you're both kind of have the same sort of goal kind of going on and things you're doing. And so you're you're definitely more antagonistic towards each other. This is not that, but I was trying to see if I could channel a bit of tune or my memory you know, loons, kind of cartoony stuff. And so I just kind of wrote this up. It's really quick right now. I'll do something with it at some point. But basically, you're just gonna roll. I wanted, I liked, so I didn't want to just have what what Honey Heist does, and it's really good, was where you have you get basically an attitude. My bear's attitude was uh, washed up. Or is it washed up or washed out? Washed up, maybe. You get the type of bear you are, and then you get a hat. Right? Funny stuff. I'm trying to really channel more D&D stuff. So those, just having those three things may not be much. So I, I have it where you're, you're, you're rolling a, you know, you roll for your, your basic, your species. But I want to do the same thing that Honey Heist did, where I just want to give really broad kind of character bits that you can use any way you see fit. You know, part of the thing here is I'm not trying to roll rules or write, write rules for all this stuff. I want you to just sit down at the table and however you feel like you can use this to your advantage, just do it. And so I, but I want to keep kind of this classic, classic D&D kind of thing. So I want you to have a hair, your sort of species. I want you to have a class. Kind of thing, and I want each of those things to kind of add to your thing a little bit. So what I came up with, is I came up with because I'm using D6, I'm using D20s for the resolution roll because it's kind of I'm going for a D and D kind of thing. So I'm going to go full D and D kind of thing with D20. But all these things you're going to roll here, which is not that many, is you're going to roll a few things. So you're going to roll your heritage. If you're a human, you're irrationally confident, and all things in bold are kind of your powers. So it's up to you in the game to figure out how to use this to your advantage. I don't 
It's not up to me. If you can figure out a way to use it, then use it. So if you're a human, you're irrationally confident. If you're an elf, you're pompous. If you're a dwarf, you're ornery. If you're a halfling, you're strangely upbeat. If you're a goblin, you're unpredictable. And if you're a kobold, you're treacherous. And that's just kind of what I came up with for some six fairly standard fantasy classes. But given just, just this little kind of quirk, and if you can figure out a way to use that quirk, good. If not, then not. Then you roll for your class. And I have I basically because I needed more than six options. So you can either be a sneak, a sword arm, or a sorcerer. If you're a sneak, you're either a burglar who has a bundle of tools and they're sneaky. A bard has a loot and they're popular. A if you're a tumbler, you have a 10-foot pole and you're acrobatic. If you're a brigand, you have a long knife and you're intimidating. If you're a thief, you have a hidden dagger and you have sticky fingers. And if you're a ninja, you have throwing stars and you have a bag of tricks. Then if you're a sword arm, you can be a soldier and have a sword and shield and are tough. You can be a reaver and you can have a big axe and be fearless. You can be a paladin and have a great sword and be insufferable. You could be a knight and wear have plate mail and be chivalrous. You could be a berserker and wear a fur, fur vest and be kind of crazy. Or a scout, you can have bow and arrows in your swip. And then finally, for the magic folks, you can be a pyromancer, an electromancer, so fire, you know, lightning, necromancer, death magic, a priest with the power of prayer, a druid who can shape shift, or a witch who can make potions. Maybe I'll change witch to alchemist, I guess, as now that I'm looking at that. I had something else to do with witch and I kind of forgot about it. Uh, thank you, and and then because magic, you notice that the the sorcerers don't get a second thing, and that's because nature's magic's powerful. But uh, Terrence says hidden daggers and sticky fingers sound like their nephews. Nice, but magic is powerful. But if you if you roll your magic and you don't make it, then it's going to rebound against whoever cast it uh, in unforeseen ways. So it's a little bit more dangerous the the magic versus the uh, the other ones. And then you get an alignment. And this I thought was pretty clever. I haven't seen this before. So if you folks can let me know if I'm just I'm just tooting my own horn here or if it really is clever. So yeah, so we're gonna have an alignment because we're playing classic DD. So you gotta have alignments. So you're either on team law or team chaos. Uh, and then you and then I, you know, I was kind of I don't know if I'll end up using this, but I did I was honey heist the way you're using a die to track your thing. I have that for your hit points. You start off with six hit points. You run into hit points, you're knocked out. You're not Again, we're going with cartoony stuff. You're not dying, but you're getting kind of knocked out of the fight temporarily if you run out of hit points. Now, when you're playing the game, there's just a few rules. You can use your these powers. I call them powers. Those things that were in caps here, fire magic or being chivalrous or plate mail. They're all kind of powers. They're yours. Use them. Use them in any way you can think of. Be fun. Be imaginative. All you gotta, all you gotta do is if you want to, you know, engage one of these powers, is you and the GM just have to agree that. It's possible. That's all you need to do. You cannot harm other adventurers directly. And I tried to kind of put directly. If you can figure out a way to do it indirectly, that's totally fine. You can't just turn and fireball the rest of the party or do something like that. You gotta, you gotta, if you wanna do it, you're gonna have to do it sort of uh, adroitly, indirectly. However, um, everybody comes back at the end of so. You have an adventure that's a number of encounters. At the end of every encounter, everybody comes back. If you are knocked out in, in first encounter, the second encounter cards, you come back, you get, you always have three hit points. You start with six, and you're not going to get six, but you'll, you'll get back up to three. Um, and then everything is in rounds. We're just going in rounds, and everybody gets an action in a round. All the actions happen simultaneously, and then at the end of the, the thing, we'll figure it out. And if we need, we do another round, we do another round. If we move, you know, whatever, you know, we just kind of adjudicate everything in that round, and we go on to the next round. So super kind of simple. Everything happens, and then it's in terms of the world, the any opponents, bad guys, anything else, it's all just it's all reactive. And in that way, it's a little bit powered by the apocalypse, you could say. It's really, it's the you know the players are all going to act and do whatever, and then all the world stuff is just going to react to that. So you know you you come in with your dagger to try to backstab the bugbear, and you know you're unsuccessful. The bugbear wipes you, lose a hit point. So. Really trying to keep it kind of super easy. D20s, you always got to be 12. So you got to roll. You really need a 13. I say beat 12. You have to roll above 12. So you got 13 or more to succeed or fail. If you, uh, if you're using a power, if you're invoking one of your powers, so let's say you're a soldier and you want to invoke your toughness to do something and that works, then you get to roll with advantage. If you roll a natural one, 
you suffer a spectacular disaster, which is you you narrate what your character does that goes awry horribly, and then you're knocked out. And then um, if you're knocked out, someone can revive you if they need to. And there's multiple ways you get there. If you're the alchemist, you could say, I I, I do a healing potion. You know, maybe if you're a, you're the priest, you can make a prayer, right? There's a number of ways someone could potentially revive you if they want to. If they don't, then the next encounter, when that encounter ends, next encounter, you're kind of back up. You're back up and running. So no one's knocked out permanently. You just might get knocked out for a round. I don't know. Maybe you're really unlucky. Two rounds, whatever. But you're going to be kind of back up pretty quickly. Now, here's where here was, here's where my wrinkle, which I thought was fun. You guys can tell me know if you think it's fun. So yeah, I'm, I'm doing kind of a scoring system using experience points because we're playing a DD and d type game. If you get that spectacular disaster, like you roll that nat one, and you blow yourself to smithereens, essentially, you get an experience point. If you complete an encounter, you get an experience point. Here's, here's, my, here's my part where I thought, like, oh, I think this is clever, but it might not be. If you're lawful, and everybody else, you know, everyone is, um, everyone is, no, or maybe I should put it away. If you're finishing, if you're lawful, and you finish an encounter, and every, nobody's knocked out, like, everybody's still standing, Instead of one XP, you earn three. However, if you're Team Chaos, you earn three experience points if you're the only other adventurer, only adventurer who's left standing. So I thought this would be a lot of fun if people are playing for the score. Because if you're chaotic, you want to finish the encounter, but you don't want to be you want to be the only one left. If you're a lawful person, you want to finish the encounter, you want everybody to be up. So I thought that would be kind of a fun secondary thing. Like if it's if there's like maybe there's me and another guy where the only ones left this encounter. And remember, we can't we can't do anything to each other directly. So it's all going to be about if I'm a certain person, how can I try to do something to get something else? How can I indirectly take care of that guy? If uh, you know, like oh, there's let's say there's a goblin here, a go NPC goblin, and the sorcerer or whatever the the alchemist is over there can i get the can i get the goblin to attack the alchemist and then i'll take out the goblin so that i can be the last one or not and as ian says that's definitely a recipe, a recipe for chaos and like yeah that's kind of the point because that's that's like how these tune game that's how honey heist was it's like you're just setting up these arenas for like super smash brothers just kind of crazy everyone just kind of going in and having having fun so i thought that would be fun um to do i might change the scoring to maybe make it a little bit less all or nothing as I'm just thinking about it. And then you you uh you vote for one character at the most kind of outstanding moment, you know, the funniest, whatever, they get some XP. And then if team law, if the collect collectivity of collect the collective collective members of team law have the most XP, then law wins. If not, chaos wins, and whoever individually had the most XP gets the MVP. So I thought that scoring would be fun. It's kind of a play on sort of tournament scoring. I hope at least the chaos, that's kind of what you want. You, you want these sort of people who are trying to do, because you, you want to get through the encounters, but then there's this other idea of if I'm chaos, and the funny thing is if I'm chaos, I don't necessarily want other chaos people. I really just want to be the only one. Like, I'm kind of playing with the selfless versus selfish. If I'm chaos, and there are three other people who are chaos, um, and it doesn't like I want all chaos to win. I still want to be the only only one if I can. And then I, the part I was kind of finishing up is just a little bit for the dungeon master. Just kind of like, because it really, it's, you're just, you're setting things up. You just want to make a really interesting environment with lots of stuff. And then you just want the players to get loose in there. And then you just, you know, you really just riff off of whatever they're doing. You know, oh, you're in a cave and the wizard tried to, or the, the pyromancer tried to make a fireball and it didn't work. You know, they rolled a natural one. And so they narrate that they blew themselves up and maybe some of the, cavern collapses and something else goes on right oh I'll do that and then you just kind of move it along and so you're just kind of setting up a little bit of sort of in the grand scheme what the adventure is but i was really inspired by honey heist i'm gonna try to finish this maybe even today at least in this kind of just word format form um but yeah that was that was uh i had a, that was a really it really kind of got my brain working in an interesting way it's and i really and like i know i need to get other things done <laughs> So it wasn't really what I was trying to do with get my brain wrapped in something else, but this is like kind of a really kind of quickie thing. Throw it out there. See what people think about it. Maybe I'll, maybe, and I would be fun. I would be fun to kind of play test this on stream sometimes with a couple of people. Just, I'm really trying to 
in a way, do kind of a D and D sort of Looney Tunes, Dungeons and Dragons meets Looney Tunes kind of thing, as if like you know someone's Elmer Fudd, someone's Bugs Bunny, someone's Daffy Duck, and they're doing you know the quest for the Holy Grail, you know, and and it's like they're all kind of working together for the Grail, but they're also kind of working against each other. So that'll be good. Anyhow, that's it. That's the wrap. Um, I'm going to try to get that interview, like I mentioned, uh, later on, later on this week with Brian Shutter. Uh, I have another recorded interview. I have some odds and ends that I recorded, like just like walking the floor of PAX East. I'll see if there's any kind of stuff that's more gems or just me. I don't know if I'll just post me walking around. I mean, you know, it's, it's not even me really, you know, I'm behind the camera. So it's just kind of like a walk of the floor. I don't know if people really dig that stuff or if even anyone really cares um but we'll see later on but there'll be more stuff going on and you know back to be working on projects and whatnot and wherefore but uh, any last thoughts before i bail out um but if not and i'll just leave a minute because i know there's a little bit of a delay and here's finally some uh spin drift still waiting on that sponsorship spin drift for the working man Whoa, that went down the wrong way. All right, well, folks, have a great rest of your day, night, whenever you end up watching or listening to this. Game on. Talk to you later. Bye now.